Hello and welcome to the Car Care Right Reviews channel and welcome to the all new 2025 Mazda CX-90 or CX-70, sorry about that. In today's video, we're gonna do a proper technical review under the hood. We're gonna check out the all new Mazda CX-70. We're gonna take a look at the outside, the inside, some things we like, some things we do not like right after this. Let's start our technical review under the hood. Now, the CX-90, CX-70, you will talk about that part in a bit. It could have two powertrains identical to the CX-90. You can have the inline six or you can have the plug-in hybrid model. Since we have the plug-in hybrid model, that's what we're gonna focus on in this video. So it's a very interesting plug-in hybrid or hybrid system. It's actually unique to Mazda. And this is something I respect because they didn't just copy somebody else's and put it here and let's go. No, they developed their own. It's actually a very interesting system, mostly good. Some stuff are interesting. Let's get into it. Let's talk about the engine first. So this is in the plug-in hybrid model. You have a four-cylinder 2.5 liter. It's, a, it's an engine actually used in a lot of their models. They did modify it a little bit for this system. So let's dig into this engine. It's called PYUL. I don't know what's up with the naming, but moving past that. It is a four-cylinder 2.5 liter direct injected engine, non-turbo. And that is the cool part here. So Mechanical construction, we do have a plastic valve cover of the nice quality variety, which is nice. It is a single piece cylinder head. It does have dual overhead cam with variable valve timing on both of them. The intake one is electronic, the exhaust one is hydraulic. This engine does have hydraulic lifters and roller rockers, which is really nice. Now, this is a direct injected engine only. Four direct injectors sit right underneath the intake manifold on the side, not on top of the valve cover, which is really nice. The high pressure fuel pump is on the side or it's a little housing, so it's not actually on top of the valve cover, which is really nice. It just gets it out of the valve cover way. The thing with this engine is it sits so far back into this that you have a giant space in the front because they're trying to get the engine past the where the axle or the wheels are. That helps with the driving dynamic of this car which helps is the word here. Let's talk about the transmission. The transmission here is an eight-speed regular automatic transmission, no ECVT, no, nothing. It's just a regular transmission, but it does not have a torque converter. And with that, let's dive into the hyper system because that's where the true magic is. And I think the system is unique, does need some work, but it is unique. So this is a single motor system, a one motor system with two clutches. And that's the unique part here. So sitting between the engine and the transmission, you have the electric motor and between the motor and the, tr and the engine and the motor and the transmission, you have two clutches. Here's how the cool part is. And, and let me dive into the driving modes and this will start to make sense how that works. So let's say we're driving in EV mode, engine is off, the battery is charged, we can drive in EV mode. The clutch between the motor and the engine will disengage. So now the engine's shut off and it's isolated, but the clutch between the motor and the transmission is engaged and we're supplying power to that motor and that's driving the transmission, therefore driving the car. But the coolest thing that I don't see other manufacturers do this, maybe because they don't have an eight speed transmission behind it, it'll actually start shifting in EV mode. It is such a cool thing, feeling wise and just efficiency wise, wait, Instead of having the engine drive the transmission, we'll just have the motor drive the transmission and it'll shift and it'll feel like a completely normal car. So, such a strange feeling in a good way. That is, I think, the genius of this, that they shift the transmission. And then if we switch to another mode, hybrid driving, so both the engine and the electric motor are driving back and forth, back and forth. The clutch between the engine and the motor will also engage and now the engine and the motor can drive or the motor can charge and they can go back and forth kind of in a hybrid fashion. But then when you get to a point where the battery is completely depleted, we need to charge it. The engine will drive the car, both clutches will be engaged. However, the motor will be generating because it's gonna be turned by the engine and we're gonna be able to charge the battery. And then there is another mode, which is the coolest thing. And I, I'm really happy that they did this. 
you have charge mode in a way. So that mode, a little button in the dash, you just push it and it actually allows you to set how much you want to charge the battery to, which is super cool, something we don't see in a lot of plug-in hybrids. So what it's gonna do in that mode, it's gonna force the engine on, it's gonna force both clutches on, and it's gonna actually keep the engine charging the battery at all times until you reach the desired level of charge that you can set from 10% all the way to 100%. That is super cool because then you can drive the car and charge the battery and then later you will have actual EV range from the plug-in hybrid part. That is super cool. You're on a trip, wherever the case may be, you can actually charge it as you're reaching your destination and you don't have to plug it in. That. It's super cool. Now, of course, your gas mileage will suffer because you have tremendous load on the engine. It's running all the time. Your gas mileage will come down, but then you make it up by having EV range without plugging it in. That is pretty cool. Now, this engine, there's something cool about it. It has two starting modes. It does have a starter. See, most hybrids or plug-in hybrids do not have a starter. The motor will just start it. But this one, because of the single motor orientation, it will actually have a backup starter. When the engine is cold, you'll hear it run the most. So you can start the engine with a regular starter or you can disengage the clutch from the transmission, engage the clutch between the engine and the motor, and then the motor spins the engine, starts it, then we start driving with the engine. Now the HVAC system in this car, it's kind of a surprise, same thing with the CX-9, I mean, it's the same car. It's very simple. It doesn't really have a heat pump or anything. Instead, here's what they did. Kept it simple, not perhaps the most efficient way, but this is not an electric car. So you have an electric compressor. When you're driving EV mode, you need to cool the cabin. You just can come on independently of the engine and we're good. But we need to heat the cabin and when you're on an EV mode, it's gonna actually turn on a coolant heater. In electric cars, that is a bad idea, but in here, should the range deplete rapidly, you have an engine. So it works and it works very well because it keeps things very simple. It's just a little heater, heats up the coolant and we're good to go. If we run out of range, engine comes on and I like that. So here's what's happened as a result of that. This has a lithium ion battery that sits underneath the car. It's a pretty big battery and that's standard for plug-in hybrids. So how do we cool and heat the battery? That is very important. Again, in, in electric cars, a lot more important, but plug-in hybrids equally. So they're gonna actually use the refrigerant to cool that battery, and you're gonna, they're gonna use an electric heater to heat up the battery as needed. Keeping it very simple, I, I like that part. Now, on paper, the system sounds like a marvel of engineering. And on paper, it does sound like a marvel of engineering. But the problem is when the real world throws the salt and pepper in the mix. That's the problem. See, you drive this car, if you're in a single mode, if you're in hybrid mode, or you're in EV mode, or you're in charge mode, everything is great, very nice, except in EV mode, it's pretty loud, it feels rudimentary, like you hear the motor spin, it's very loud, and that because of that, you actually feel every single shift because you hear the motor kind of rev up, and then down, I'm talking about the electric motor, not the engine. You really hear it's loud, it feels rudimentary. It's such a nice car and we're going after the whole luxury thing, but it's loud and you feel everything. But the problem happens when you start going into hybrid mode, where we're going back and forth, back and forth. You're driving in hybrid mode, the engine is off, you're in EV mode. You took off and then you accelerate. Here's what has to happen. Everything stops. The clutch disengages from the transmission, the clutch between the engine and the motor engages, turns on the engine, and then the, the other clutch engages, then we're going. I mean, there is a noticeable delay, and then the clunkiness of things. You come to a stop, it wants to shift to, to EV mode or just let the engine idle and then shut it off, it just, you feel it. You feel every single transition of the system and they're slow. I feel like they can refine this and in the CX-90 they did issue a software update on both the inline 6 and this to kind of make things a little smoother. It feels like this particular one didn't get that update, it's unknown why, but it is very clunky. That's the only, it's not refined, I mean you look at this beautiful car, how it looks, this and the CX-90 basically the same. 
it's such a beautiful car, it's so refined. They're heading in this direction, but the powertrain needs more refinement. It just it has to be said. Now, one note between this and the inline six. This on paper sounds a hundred times more complicated than the inline six, but that is so far from the truth. Folks, this is a very basic engine. I mean it doesn't even have a turbocharger. Tiny. You have tons of room around it. It's very basic and it's old school actually this engine on a little bit on the old school side for Mazda at least they've been using it for a long time and the whole hybrid system it's actually not over complicated for example you don't have a heat pump you don't have all fancy stuff going in the battery to do no it's very very basic so comparing this to the inline six this is actually simpler and I'm hoping long-term reliability will be better. So at least we have other options than the mega complicated inline six with its 48 volt system. And then something just small note to Mazda, actually mostly. So this car and, and equally the inline six in the CX-90, the same car. So this engine cover has a very fancy hook where you could open it and hook it up and it looks wonderful. Except there are two problems with that. Every single pre repair procedure on this car, step number one, remove the engine cover, which actually just pops right out. And the second thing is, I feel like gimmicks like this were made to impress the press pool or a press fleet or however you want to call it. Ooh, look at this fancy cover. It's actually completely redundant. I wish we would have not made things like that. It just doesn't make sense at all. Let's take a look at the outside and the inside of the CX-90, I mean the CX-70, and before we even get into it, let's drop that, the CX-90, CX-70. This is a CX-90 with a CX-70 badge, and as we look through it, you'll uh, start to see what's going on with the world with Mazda today. I, I was completely shocked when I saw this car. However. Talk about that a little bit in the video. Let us just pretend we don't know that fact and we're gonna keep going. Very nice looking car, just like the CX-90. Sorry, I, we said we were not gonna mention that. I really like their new design language. They're trying to position themselves into the luxury market. And I don't know about you, but at least my humble opinion, this is quite a looker in the front. I mean, it is an elegant design. Look at this headlight, how small it is. It's just We've reviewed two Mazda CX-90s, and by the way, this is exactly the same. I really like how this looks. I love this, this hood line that comes here and just curves. It's a really good looking car and has a very exotic shape. Now on the side here, we um, do not have painted wheel arches or the bottom, which is okay. Of course, they still display what kind of Mazda CX-90 or CX-70 this is plug-in hybrid vehicle or inline six. These are the two powertrains as we talked about. The doors are still not the most solid door feeling wise. Of course, there's nothing wrong with it, but then the handles are a little bit on the cheaper side for a car that we're trying to push it as a luxury car. However, this back door opens 90 degrees. This is the coolest feature of any car we have ever seen. This is a feature that is actually simple to make for the manufacturer, but it's so useful. I mean, look, look at this entrance, look at the seat up. This is super wide and super nice to enter. I think every car should have this. It is one of the coolest things. And then the charging door is massive. I don't know why manufacturers do that. Somewhat on the flimsy side. I don't know again why they do that. You do have a cover, which is nice. You do have a light which is also nice, it's kind of a door that you don't have to open it from the inside as long as the car is unlocked, that you can open it that way. Then we roll around the back. The first thing we should pay attention to is that this is a CX-70 because it's extremely difficult to tell from the outside. Really like the look at the back. This has a very, very luxurious look. The bumper very small here. This is typical of our auto manufacturers in the modern times, but it does have a little bit of a bumper, not over the top. Now, this is where we talk about the elephant in the room. 
This is a CX-70, an all-new model, independent of the CX-90. Except up to this point in the video, I've mentioned the word CX-90 more than I have the CX-70. Let's take a look in the back and... Where's my third row seat? No, it's not hidden. There is no third row seat. And if we pull this and pull this, which is very super afterthought, you have storage there in a very interesting fashion. I wonder if this comes up. No, it does not. So let us just not keep mentioning the CX-90 here. This is a CX-9 without third row seat. Would it cost exactly the same or more if you go to the base model? I'll just leave you to sink that in. And let us clarify one thing, which we're going to talk about ooh, a lot more in the video. Why would anyone... Correct me if I'm wrong. Maybe, maybe I am getting old and just not no longer making sense here. It's very possible. But why would anyone buy a two-row large SUV? I thought the whole point of buying a two-row SUV was it being smaller. Otherwise, get the one with the third-row seat, fold the seats down when you need them, but you have them when you need them. And if you never need them, how about your resale value? Oh, but wait, maybe this is cheaper. That's a very valid reason. Well, we're buying the same car with lesser options, even though it's not, but it should be cheaper, right? Well, that's wrong. Because they, the way the packaging works in this, the base model or the lowest trim you can get on the CX-70, which is a lesser car than the CX-90, by number, of course, is more expensive because they don't have the same base model. And then as you go up in the price range, they're exactly the same price, which makes absolutely no sense to me. I don't get it. What's going on here? I mean, I don't even. I'm, I'm sorry. We've been talking about this car all this time. I'm trying to really be fair here, but this part makes absolutely no sense. This is not a CX. This is not a different. But it's exactly the same car with no third row. Let's look at the inside, for example. The same exact interior of the CX-90 with some different colors and whatnot, but I don't understand. I mean, the CX-90 is a very nice car. It's not perfect. No car is ever perfect. Same silly shifter here. Same everything, even though in the CX-90, some of the lower trims don't have touchscreen. This one, they're all touchscreen, and this has very, very nice red, red leather, the nice seats, very comfortable, super comfortable second row. But this is a CX-90. And this being the plug-in model, you can still activate your charge, so it would charge the battery as you drive, and then you have EV range. Everything is exactly the same. So, the CX-90, CX-70, I don't understand what's going on here, folks. Mazda is changing direction. They're going in a direction of luxury and they're figuring things out as we go. That's the, the best way to describe it because the CX-90 was a very interesting car. It's not perfect, but it's such a radical departure from everything they've done in the past and it looks good. It has so much good things about it. It does need some work, but again, nothing is perfect in life. Then they made the announcement of the CX-70, which is an all new two row SUV. I mean, we assumed we, we've been assuming that it's going to be a CX-60, like the European market. They're going to kind of relabel it, and it's an all ex kind of a, an exclusive car on its own. Yeah, maybe it'll share the powertrain with the CX-90. That's fine. They just developed this engine, at both the inline six and the... But no. Folks, first, let's start with an apology to you, my awesome viewers. I'm sorry we have wasted your time with this video because could have wrapped this up in 30 seconds. This is a CX-90 with no third row. They cost more at the base level and at the higher trips, they cost exactly the same, which absolutely makes no sense. I don't know what's going on with Mazda. This is kind of more on the serious side. It kind of broke my heart. We got this car and we were really excited about it. It's the first 25 Mazda that we review and really interested in Mazda lately, how they're changing their direction. 
I usually don't like to attend the press releases and all that mess because if the car is not sitting in front of me and I'm able to drive it freely and really look around it, what do we know about this car? Nothing. That's the God honest truth. This car gets delivered and I go take one good look at it. I'm like, did they deliver their own car here? Because this is a CX-90. I walk around it, it's a CX-70. I'm like, well, I guess not. And I spend a considerable amount of time trying to find what is different about this car other than the lesser number in the back. Well, then I saw the third row seat is missing. And the color of the seats, maybe the trim, and you know, the VIN is a, a 25 VIN. But other than that, it's exactly the same. And this is the part that doesn't make sense the most. So the CX-70 has similar trims to the CX-90, but less. But the base model of the CX-90 doesn't exist in the CX-70. Therefore, the lowest trim you can get in the CX-70 is actually more expensive than that of the CX-90, even though they're not optioned the same level, but still. I don't understand that part. And then we go into the equal trims, higher trims. They're cost exactly the same as the CX-90. Now you could say we're moving from 24, 25, cars are getting more expensive. But that doesn't make sense at all because this is a lesser car. Let's just put it this way. Lesser car, not in everything else because it's exactly the same. It has less function because if you fold the third row seat on the CX-90, it turns into a CX-70. So technically, it's not an all new model. It's exactly the same car with no third row seat. But wait, it gets worse than that. Why would anyone want to buy a very large SUV like this one that doesn't have a third row seat? When you can simply fold it and use that usable space. Because I thought the whole idea of not buying a three-row SUV if you don't need one is that the car will be smaller, better on gas, less weight, less expensive, that's kind of a big deal, and easier to drive and easier to park and probably cheaper on insurance. I don't know what's going on with Mazda with this one. I am completely shocked. This goes against everything they have been doing. They basically just, okay, well, we have the CX-90, it's kind of had mis mixed reviews because we're really changing our direction. So let's just change the badge, remove a seat, and let's call it a new model. Folks, this is not a new model. I am sorry to say that, and I am one of the people that was most disappointed when I see this car. It simply is not. It's exactly as a CX-90 with no third row, which makes absolutely no sense. I don't know what's going on with Mazda, but I hope this is just nobody's perfect. And I like Mazda so much that in the direction they're going, we're going to call this a uh, hiccup and we're going to move on. Folks, I hope this video is helpful and informative. I hope you learned something new. If you like it, consider giving it a thumbs up. If you're not a subscriber, consider subscribing to the channel. Check out some of my other videos. Until the next video, folks, may the Lord bless you and keep you. And you have yourself a wonderful day.